we could vote now. We got one missing. Yeah, I'll take that. Uh, off the table. <laughs> what? I'm gonna take that item off the table. Now there's an odd number here. What do you want to do? Move with you. Okay. Move uh, we're moving on now to item 209, which is, which is to consider a report from the Ordnance Committee regarding parking on Fezzanin Road and on Ocean House Road near Kettle Cove. Uh, Frank Rattori is not here tonight, but the Ordnance Committee is recommending that the current no parking areas on Fezzanin Road and on Ocean House Road near Kettle Cove be kept as is. We further recommend that the remainder of Ocean House Road, both sides, from the Kettle Cove takeout, heading toward Kettle Cove, to the no parking area be posted. No parking, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., May 1st to October 1st. That's the proposal from the Audience Committee. Uh, does anyone on the Audience Committee have any, any comments they'd like to make for us? I, no? I have a comment. No? I have a comment. Okay. I thought when we sent that back to the Ordnance Committee that we was only going to, uh, and I didn't go at that last meeting, we was only going to have no parking from 9 to 6 down to the tollway zone. Down is to the where it says no parking tollway zone. Huh. Now, as I read this, it's going to be no parking all the way to the cove. Is that correct? This seasonal, if I'm an answer. Okay, yeah, go ahead. I believe that the seasonal uh, parking ban would extend all the way down to where there is no parking, which is in the area below the houses. Isn't that correct? That's where that zone is. Yeah. Mind all the current no parking tow zone, my would understanding stay. through this proposal, would stay just would as stay. they are. The only change would be further up. Ocean House Road, uh, you'd have up to Bowery Beach Road would be posted, no parking, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. May 1 through October 1. Everything else would stay the same. Yep, yeah, but that isn't what this is saying. It's saying to the cove, isn't it? What is it? No, no. Heading. This memo says from the takeout. We further recommend the remainder of Ocean House Road, both sides of Kettle Cove. From the Kettle Cove takeout. From the Kettle Cove takeout, heading towards Kettle Cove. To the no parking area. This is from the ice cream stand. Okay. To I the no to parking way. area. That's it. Say, to yeah. the no parking area. To the tollway zone. Already. Huh? To the tollway zone. That's okay. why it's no parking. Yeah. The. I think you know the, the operative thing you probably should be looking at is what was sent to you in the, in the packet with the actual language proposed for this, uh, the packet that you received uh, on Tuesday. What that is is to keep. First of all, no, no change at all in the current language, but under limited parking, you would add a new section, which only applies to uh, the rest of uh, Bowery Beach Road. And what that would read is no parking from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. from May 1 through October 1 on either side of Ocean House Road from both its intersections with Bowery Beach Road easterly to a point 150 feet northerly of the Ocean House Road, President Road intersection. That 150 foot point is where those no parking tow zones start. Okay. That, that's what the current language of the ordinance is no parking 150 feet uh, from that 150 feet northerly point southerly, southeasterly back to uh, Kettle Cove. Okay. So. Yes, uh, Lester? Uh, well, where uh, Tom Lay is here and wants to wake up, uh, how. Uh, can this readily be enforced if you use this language and there is no such place as Kettle Cove legally? There is no legal place called Kettle Cove down in Cape Elizabeth. Well, uh, I mean, it's, it, you know, here it says Pheasant Road and on Ocean Isles Road near Kettle Cove to be kept as is. And it says towards Kettle Cove. There's no such place as Kettle Cove. 
really. That is some, the actual language yeah, lesson that's being recommended. You had the wrong sheet the same as I did last week. Excuse me. Yes. I would move the, uh, the item 209 to read as uh, indicated on the memo we got in our Tuesday night package. Okay. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Paul Oh, I'm sorry. You know, no. would you? Are you voting? Uh, I'm voting. Yeah. Well, it was the motion to set the public hearing on uh, the second Monday in January at 7:30. That's what it was. Yeah. This for public hearing? Yes. Yes. I thought, excuse me, I thought this was a result of a public hearing we had and we changed the wording. Do we have to set that for public hearing again? The, re in response to that the result of the public hearing was to send this back to the audience committee. That's correct. To review it. Okay. And that was, that's what I meant. Okay. All those in favor of sending this to public hearing? Any opposed? Yeah. Monday, January 11th, 7.30 p.m. As I just saw written there somewhere. Yes. Yes. Yes, right. Okay, that, that motion carries unanimously. That? Item two, 210 is to consider clarifying the action the com council took in November regarding no parking in a bike lane in a business zone. Michael? Yeah, Councilor Lester Jordan correctly pointed out that we incorrectly posted the bike lane signs uh, following the approval of the, the bike lane ordinance. Those have since been changed. I believe now they are totally in conformance with the ordinance. I'm sorry that it happened. Uh, I feel at this point uh, we should look at it, see how it works, and if anything needs to come up later in the future, uh, perhaps should entertain it. But uh, you know, I would suggest at this point that you, you merely accept the report and perhaps thank Councillor Lester Jordan for bringing it to our attention. And, and we thank Lester John now seconded. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay, that motion carries 16. <laughs> Item 211 is to consider authorizing the signing of an agreement with the Maine State Housing Authority for an affordable housing planning study. Uh, you have in front of you an agreement from Elizabeth Mitchell, director of the Maine State Housing Authority, awarding the towns of Cape Elizabeth and uh, Yarmouth a, a, an amount of $6,000 uh, for the purpose of studying ways of encouraging and supporting affordable housing through actions at the municipal level. And uh, the agreement is a little over two pages long. Basically, uh, gives the state uh, the right to uh, receive the study uh, uh, that we prepare and, and to be able to, to draw on our research and use that in other towns as they see fit. But someone I like I move authorization on the signing of this agreement between the uh, town of Cape Elizabeth and Yarmouth and Maine State Housing Authority. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes, Doug? Just a brief explanation why I'm going to vote against this. I'm all in favor of affordable housing, very much in favor of it. But I think in trying to study affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth, I think we, we're trying to fool people into thinking that we may have an opportunity for affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth. Maybe my definition of affordable housing is wrong, but I think affordable housing is anything under $85,000. Sixty to eighty-five thousand dollars for your targeted affordable house. Our lots are costing more than that out here, and I think by accepting, even though it's only six thousand dollars to do a study, that perhaps that six thousand dollars could have better gone to someone trying to buy an affordable house rather than a very affluent community trying to decide why we can't have affordable housing in our community. So I just wanted to put that on the record and I'm uh, not opposed to affordable housing. I just think that uh, we're misusing the money. There is a definition of affordable housing as used by the May State Housing Authority in this agreement, and it says, uh, the term affordable housing shall be defined as housing which, whether it be rental or single family home ownership, is not available to residents of the community using normally and reasonably available financing resources from the private. 
I think that's a broader uh, definition of affordable housing that most people often think of when they think of affordable. Are there any other comments? Yes. I'm a, I'm in favor of affordable housing, similar to Councilor Tinsman. But what disturbs me, and Cape Elizabeth seems to have a habit of doing it, is turn around and pass an ordinance that's against, that works against affordable housing. The, here a few years ago, that 200-foot frontage deal increases a lot, increases and wastes land, and you can't get, in my opinion, affordable housing when you enact ordinances that goes against and increase land, increase the building, and increase the cost of a house. Now, I, the people that's going to study this, God bless them, but I don't see how you're going to come up with affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth. And, uh, and I haven't made up my mind yet whether I'm voting for it or against it, right at the, even right at this point. At this point, before I come to the meeting, I'm going to vote against it because what Cape Elizabeth is doing in enacting ordinances and uh, the way they are proposing to develop their land. And I don't see how we can do it. We have a place in Cape Elizabeth, and I don't think they are uh, what Councilman Tinsman uh, figures as affordable housing now, even if one of them come available for sale. It's way beyond my opinion of affordable housing. So I just want to make those comments. One of the items that this study would finance is uh, hiring COG or person at COG to look at both the ordinances in Cape Elizabeth and in Yarmouth to see exactly which ordinances are uh, getting in the way of uh, allowing us to possibly develop some affordable housing program. So that would be one of the items that would be looked at. So I think if that's a concern of yours, that you might want to consider voting uh, to go ahead with this project and accept the funds. Yeah, yes. Just comment yeah. briefly. It was COG who drew up most of our new ordinances that are contrary to. Well, at the request, at the request right, at, of at our, our planning request. board. But it was that same organization that will be reviewing what they already wrote. A different person. Oh, means they should understand the, how to read them. Okay, any other discussion of the motion? Yes. yes, yes. I just want to say that COG was responding, you know, subdivision regulations, for example. They were responding to the concerns of the planning board, and most of those changes were, many of them were environmental um, by nature. Um, the planning board was at that time not concerned with affordable housing, but our old comprehensive plan certainly stresses the desirability of a sociological economic mix in this community. And it may well be that the new comprehensive plan, which is being de developed, will also emphasize that. But right now, all we're doing is following out a directive is in the present comprehensive plan. And we don't know that we can't have affordable housing until we have looked at the ordinances and see whether or not and how they are preventing it. And if they are, do we want to choose that over environmental concerns? That's all we're doing here. Just one last thing. Uh, I <clears throat> would like to remind the council that one of our goals this year was to try to, to do something about looking into affordable housing in this community. And uh, the council did authorize us to go ahead and try to do something and to work with the town of Yarmouth and to pursue this uh, grant. Now that we have received the grant, I <laughs> hope oh, that after all the work that has been done, uh, that you're going to be willing to, to accept it at least allow us as a community to look into the possibility that there might be something that we can do so that uh, people can t continue to, to live in this town uh, who do not have the means that many of many uh, that people have to have to purchase the housing that is available at this time. Yeah? I'd just like to answer Councilor Matheson just one point that kind of crosses 
my mind as she was speaking and maybe I took it the wrong way and what have you. You say a lot of the ordinances that was enacted was environmental and uh, the, we was going at <coughs> what the planning board's wishes, but the planning board has talked for more than a year that I know of about having a community that everybody could afford to live into it, live in it. And I hope, and I got from the way you spoke, that environmental issue would almost strike me as affordable housing was a problem, the way you uh, put it across to me. Now, maybe I misunderstood you, and I hope I did. You did. Okay. All I'm saying is, is that your environmental concerns may well clash with your sociological concerns, and that sometimes the cake might have to choose. Yes, that's the problem we have here with clashing is our philosophical differences with sociological concerns. You require. 10% uh, of your subdivision to be given to the town when you require 200 foot frontage, when you require view open vistas, when you scenic corridors, and all these other philosophical problems that are contrary to affordable housing, that's where you have your, your, your absolute lines going in different directions. And that's my concern that this council, who wants affordable housing, applied for the grant last week or last meeting or the meeting before, adopted ordinances that are absolutely contrary to the study. I mean, if you're going to do a study, have a study on how not to have affordable housing. And I think this town will do very well. Move the question. <coughs> All those in favor of the motion to accept the grant from the Maine State Housing Authority. All those opposed. Okay, the motion carries five to one. Okay, item 212 is to consider a report from the town manager on the store availability charge for vacant lots. Michael? I, I think, you know, as evident in a lot of the conversation tonight, sometimes when you pass something you have uh, unintended results and uh, certain problems to deal with that you, you didn't encounter. One of them that I've experienced recently was when you adopted a sewer availability charge for vacant lots. Uh, uh, you did that at the recommendation of the Sewer Advisory Committee. Uh, specifically, what that provides is that the sewer availability charge uh, would be assessed for buildings not yet connected to the sewer, and I think that portion is fine, but also on vacant lots upon which a structure could be located in conformance with the area width, frontage, setback, and use requirements of the zoning ordinance. Unfortunately, you know, we might be prejudging an application before it's received by putting a charge on a particular lot, someone would say by the fact we had a vacant lot on it that therefore we made it buildable. Uh, or, or the town's already said it's buildable. I'm, I'm very concerned that uh, that accusa accusation might, may uh, fly back at us. An additional problem I see is that the availability charge may encourage growth. Uh, it's 250 feet per, uh, excuse me, $250 per year per whatever one of those lots we think could could uh, get in there by based on frontage. For example, to someone in, a, in an RA's, RC zone, excuse me, with 500 foot of frontage, they have to pay five avail availability charges. Uh, if there's someone with 700 feet, they'd have to pay seven. Uh, I, I think that might tend to encourage someone who's uh, farming land or has an old farmhouse or something to begin to sell off some of it. And I, I think that's kind of contrary to uh, our preservation of the rural character and, and those goals of the comprehensive plan we, we hold so dear. Uh, so for that reason, uh, and plus the fact, I tried to come up with a list and it, it, it was uh, almost impossible to do, even with, with the help of the computer. Uh, so what I'd like to do is have an intern uh, look at it this summer and study the full impl implications of it and report back to the council at the end of the summer and that meanwhile uh, you place the quarterly availability charge uh, for vacant lots in abeyance and you refer the issue for study uh, to the Board of Sewer Appeals with a request to report back to the Town Council in the fall of 1988. Yes, Bill? Uh, two things. 
when we delay this, what's going to happen with your funding as far as your repayment? Is that going to affect it? No, we have a, uh, a total sewer budget of about a million dollars at this point. We projected the revenue uh, from this would be about ten thousand uh, dollars during this during this year. Okay, and my next question was: I had always understood until they s divided that frontage up, it would only be one charge. That isn't the way it reads. So no. I misunderstood it that's again. Right. Uh, it would be five that, charges. If I it was think that's asinine to have an open piece of land before they even divide it and think they're going to develop it to charge them for a lot. You're dividing it up, and as you just said earlier, you want them to develop it by what this was enacted. Okay. I think I, it needs study. Yes, Scott? One of the concerns I've got here is the fact that together with this readiness to serve fee, you also have a provision that if your septic system is fine and you don't think it's necessary to hook up, we used to require within so many days that you hook up. And now with this readiness to serve fee, it satisfied my problem with a lot of people who had just had expensive septic systems put in and thought they could get some additional time out of them. Rather than to destroy them and have to hook up, this gave them a mechanism to use their existing system. This charge is just a readiness to serve charge. Basically, it reserves capacity in a very tight system that this council or this town philosophically is all in agreement on, I thought. You thought? Prior, <laughs> prior to recent elections. I think the whole council thought a reduced system was, or, or a very tight system was in the best interest of the town. If we put this in abeyance, what happens to the people who have hooked up and perhaps didn't need to, or are not going to hook up because their system is good, and how does that affect the cost of the overall users that are now paying twice what they paid last year? This all figured into a formula. <coughs> This has nothing to do with people with current systems functioning or malfunctioning. The only thing I'm proposing to hold in abeyance are those with no building and no septic system, totally vacant lots. The others would still be assessed the availability charge. This only applies to vacant lots. I, I think the point you raise about reserving a, a uh, sewer user unit for capacity purposes is a very valid point. And that's one reason, you know, why I think it, it needs a lot more further study, because I think we need to do something to still recognize the fact of you sort of creating a reservation. I don't know what the solution is to it, uh, but uh, it's a very valid point. And that's why I think it's important that we not just kill the charge totally and forget about it, but that we do look at it again uh, over the summer and uh, the council itself in the fall. Yeah. You suggest, Michael, that um, <clears throat> an exception for lots with buildings within 150 feet of the public sewer line, that you would keep those in under the availability charge, as I read this. Could you tell us why you made that, you want to make that exception? Yes. What, what I've, I'm not really looking for an exception. You know, I know it's worded except I, I, want to, I want to make the positive statement. I want to keep the availability charge for lots with buildings on them. Yeah. I think that's consistent with the policy that we've had throughout, and it was con it was exactly what was told in the material that the town handed out in, before the last referendum. The town, to my knowledge, never said in the material that went out with that last referendum that we're going to charge an availability charge on vacant lots. You know, I see it as a, as a totally separate issue. Uh, you know, anything within 150 feet does have sewer availability to it. You know, there's a you can see the direct connection between the two. Uh, uh, people seem to have accepted that charge. Uh, they're, they're going through the process. Uh, most of the people are connecting. There'll be very few subject to it, I think, uh, as things turn out. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. I just want to say that when we did the Northern system, we tried to charge for those vacant lots, and it was such an uprise from the general public, especially had a, a vacant lot that we did away with it, and I concur, I don't think we should charge now. I think those people, if they wanted to reserve some 
wanted to utilize that and put a stub in or something and, and reserve the right that maybe in the future to build, all right, but but just to go out and charge for a vacant lot, that's, there again, making that affordable housing. Yes, about how many vacant lots are we talking, Michael? I, I ran a list off the computer, and after studying it, I have no idea. Uh, Are we because talking a hundred? I have no idea. Because, for example, it, this, you take Hopstone. Hopstone has 55 units built, 44 still to go. Are those 44 units all vacant lots? I don't know. Maybe it's addressed in there. I, I would assume that they are. Uh, when you look at the other lots, you know, I'm not totally sure you know, upon which a structure could be located in conformance to the area with front setbacks. You know, that doesn't seem to address there to me wetlands, you know, some of those other issues that, that may make something unbuildable. You know, per, perhaps, well, it says use requirement. Uh, you know, maybe use means wetlands. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, it, there's so much interpretation within that, I couldn't begin to come up with a number. I came well, up with a list of about 500, but... Uh, that isn't, I know that's not what was, what was intended. Well, what's going through my mind is, um, one of the concerns in the debate over the, the, the Southern Cape sewer was growth. And a lot of people wanted to kind of use the treatment plant as a means of controlling growth. And there's a certain amount of capacity in it, um, which the town went along with. And once we have reached that capacity, there, there will be no more use of that sewer, no additional use. What happens if you're subtracting maybe 500 vacant lots out of that capacity? What happens when the next developer comes along with a 200 uh, unit development? I don't think anything really does because there are other requirements uh, which tie in in order to connect to the sewer separate and apart from these. And most of those 500 units are in the in the northern section, and quite a few of those have already been approved uh, and already have access to the sewer. They just haven't hooked in yet. They just haven't put them in the bill yet. Uh, you know, the way the ordinance is set up, you have to meet certain other requirements in, uh, in order to hook up. There's also another ordinance becoming before you next month that, that ties down the, the allocation exactly that was in, as was in the facility plan that, that spells it out a little bit better. Uh, the town attorney prepared the language and received it uh, at the end of last week, and I didn't put it on the agenda due to uh, uh, expected late hour tonight. Well, I really, I really would hope that, that the um, discussion on the Sewer Board of Appeal uh, would be culminated long before the fall of 1988. I really think there's some urgency in this. Yeah, the only reason I delayed then because I wanted to have an intern work on this this summer, and uh, you know, it's it's not as far off as it seems. Can you get an intern this winter? I don't know. Maybe, maybe you don't agree, but uh, it makes me kind of nervous having it in limbo until a year from now. Well, Nancy, I think if it might help. Uh, I don't believe that the new treatment plant ever expected, or it was, it was never figured into what uh, the amount of uh, reserve in, in that. It was 500 lots was never pounded. I don't think. We're talking. Yeah, we're talking. And most of these lots are oh, in the yeah. northern end. I, I know that's right, but that's what I'm saying. Eighty percent of lots in the, in the southern case. Right. Also, most of the lots are undevelopable now because they ought to be on the sewer. Right. But so most of the lots that he's talking about are on the northern, so not on the north. The, the, the difference is in the northern end, you have all these things that have been approved, were approved. Because they were approved early, they could still go into the sewer. They were grandfathered. You didn't have that in the southern end. Plus, in the southern end, you don't have you have more customary type lots because there there were lots that were approved in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. While in the northern end, you've got lots approved in the 30s and uh, 
you know, a lot more stranger configurations. I guess I'm lost, but with the way that was adopted, the uh, way it was set up, you mean to tell me that the way you were figuring this out, that that sewer that goes down through the field over there off of Spurk Avenue, with a line on, with a field on both sides of it, that you can set up and charge him for a lot all the way down through that field that he's farming? No. Because you, you've got to have street frontage in order to build, and then you have to have frontage on a public sewer line. You need both those factors. So it doesn't quite fit that way. It don't fit that way? I don't think so, but I... It, okay. Well, I hope it don't. Someone prepared to make a motion item 2, uh, 12? Yes, sir. Yes, I move that we send this back to the uh, Board of Sewer, sewer Appeals for further study. And what about the hiring of an intern? Is that part of your motion? Uh, I didn't see that in here, so I didn't say anything about that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we don't need it. You have money already to do that. You funded an intern in the budget. Okay. Is there a second to us this morning? Second. Is there further discussion? Yes, Penny. Excuse me, but should we also be, uh, I don't understand, did you, did you did you not agree to eliminate the availability charge uh, except for buildings within the 150 foot, 150 foot feet of the public sewer line and with frontage on a public sewer line? We should be passing both of those. Yeah, I, I very much want you to keep the fee within 150 feet because I want to keep the incentive for those folks to connect that already have the buildings there. That's right. So that item number okay, so one, that, that recommended item number one should also be part of this motion or, or, or the second motion. You see it, Lester? On the bottom of that page, it's, it says item number 212 on top of it. Under, yeah. Under the notes. I still have two motions. Do you want to? Add number one to go to, along to with the <laughs> manager recommend Recommendation. To the yes. manager's recommendation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there a discussion? Yes, Just one question. If you figure that there are 500 readiness to serve lots that are going to come off the budget now for the sewer users, and that's 500 times 250 off, how does that affect the sewer users' increased participation? Okay. And, uh, we did not budget 500 readiness to serve charges. We budgeted uh, enough to add up to about, in this fiscal year, about $10,000. It, it doesn't have that much of an impact. The other thing that's happened is a lot more homes have gone in a lot quicker in the northern end than we anticipated. Uh, can't, uh, Canterbury by the Cape is you know, going very, very rapidly. Stonegate's going rapidly. And in the southern end, they're connecting sooner than anticipated, so we're doing all right with the revenue. And in those 500, you know, that was the preliminary what came out. You know, I think after you studied it, you know, it would whittle itself down to, you know, perhaps 200. But, you know, that, that was the initial what the computer uh, generated out. Okay. Just to follow up on Nancy's concern earlier, if we take these lots off, take their allocations away from them while it's in abeyance, we have a proposal for 50 or even 100 new units in the southern Cape section. And they can prove that there's capacity with these lots held in abeyance. I think the town is going to be in a hot spot to deny them access. By holding this in abeyance, you're saying that these don't exist and that they don't have the right to hook into that sewer. No. All you're holding in abeyance is the charge or the assessment. You already have an ordinance which provides who is allowed to hook up and who is not allowed to hook up. Provided they pay their fee. That's not the... That's not they, in that they portion can, of the they ordinance. Can, they can go on record as saying, look, I don't care. If we, we're not going to pay the fee. Therefore, if we decide to develop this lot at some time, if there's capacity, we'll pay our back costs and get into the sewer system. I'm only concerned that there's going to be a problem because we've discussed this thoroughly throughout my five years in here, and this sewer availability charge has been important in the last section. I, I'm only yeah. concerned. I want to go on record. 
I, I agree with your concern, except I have a greater concern, you know, that, you know, you're going to fill this room with a, with a requirement that I think is totally unworkable and uh, real problems with definition, and, you know, we're all going to be sitting up here wondering, you know, why do we ever pass this thing and, uh, you know, trying to defend something that I feel is in, indefensible. I would rather uh, have it in abeyance and deal with that other problem than try to defend something that's totally indefensible. Okay, all those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Okay. Motion carries five to one. I wrote down six to nothing. <laughs> Item 213 <laughs> is to consider signing again. This is, this is a new, new like item that. for us. For the Portland Water District's records, the utility location permit for the Southern Cape Elizabeth Sewer The minutes of the Town Council in April 1986 show you approve this. The district does not have it in their records. I debated just passing it around, asking you to sign it, but I'm sure that would have raised all sorts of questions, so I decided to put it on the agenda, have you specifically authorize it again, and I'll sign it. So moved. I move. I move we sign. Okay, go ahead. Any discussion? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Can everybody vote on that? No, I was going to discuss it. You was going to say something, but we... we Save it for, for another item. <laughs> Motion carries six. Well, I was going to say that. I'm going to take it up again. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> be fast. Now, this hour, let's be fast. Item 214, to consider authorizing the town manager to sign an agreement with the Portland Water District for the ownership, operation, and maintenance of the Hunts Point pump station. Michael? Uh, you did something very similar with the other pump stations in the southern end of Cape Elizabeth. As you remember, you added a little portion of the project after you the rest of the project, those of you that were on the council at that time. Uh, this merely takes that one last pump station and puts it under uh, district responsibility. My, my main concern for this is that, to me, it doesn't make any sense for the town to send one person out to, to Broad Cove and that whole area of town uh, to do it. And uh, there's, all, there's other concerns with training and backup and all those things and, and equipment that the district has backup things to put in and has uh, also, you know, the up running to do it. So I'd, I'd urge you to pass this and uh, do it tonight. Uh, Just one question to the manager. Is that all we're doing is letting them uh, operate the pump station? That don't give them the station or give them the land under the station or anything to that effect? I believe that it does, but let me check. We shall transfer it to the district by bill of sale and the district shall acquire, own, finance, manage, and operate. Yes, they will own it. The station? The station. It to them? Not the land. For one dollar. You know, if you, you can charge them twenty thousand dollars if you want, but the charter requires, their charter requires, and the, the vote of the people of Cape Elizabeth in 1969 requires that they're just going to charge you back for it. So, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to, to charge them any more for it. That's like that land that we had to buy that they still own? Down at People's Gold? That's right. Which which doesn't make sense to me. Another issue for another evening. So, to answer my question so I understand it correctly, they're going to own the plant, operate the plant, and own the land underneath the plant? That's the correct, to, sir. And the way to get to it? Yeah, it's it's right at the end of Hunts Point Road, right? I know right? where it is, yeah. but they got to walk out a little ways there. They can't drive. Well, they drive pretty close to it, but they're off of the main road. Yeah, they're, they're just off the cul-de-sac. Some of it's still in the public right-of-way, and other, we acquired some land from Central States Cotton Company and from the Schmaders. So they get it for a buck? For a buck. The buck probably won't change hands. The buck stops here. Okay, move on. So moved. Oh. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion carries 6 to 9. <coughs> Item 215 is to consider authorizing the town manager to sign an agreement with the Maine Municipal Association to up, update town job descriptions. Sure. You have a memo on this that's fairly self-explanatory uh, for the benefit of those in the audience. We, we have job descriptions for almost every position. Uh, I think the Director of Public Works, for some reason we don't have one. There may be one or two others. However, they're all outdated. They follow no set format, um, and they're also uh, they they were they were done by bringing someone in who didn't consult with anyone. 
Uh, what I'd suggest, what I'd like to do is to be able to have a totally new good set of job descriptions. There's a proposal here from MMA uh, to do this, explains how they would do it. The cost is $1,850, and you did have money in the, the 110 2010 account for special studies contingency. And so I would ask that you authorize me to uh, contract with MMA to undertake a job description process. Okay. So moved. Is there a second? Any second? Is there any discussion? Yes. Lester? Why, why can't we do this ourselves? We, we must know what these people do in this town. Why do we have to hire it then? There are a number of reasons. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the only person who, who would really be doing it is the town manager. And, uh, you know, I, th I think you have to recognize you eliminated the manager's assistance position when the present manager was hired. And uh, the council has very high expectations, reasonably so, of what the manager should accomplish. And uh, quite frankly, uh, the manager just doesn't have time to, to devote to this. And I, I think the MMA is far more expert at it since they deal uh, with this all the time. So it's uh, bad. Aren't they have to write a job description of maybe some other town rather than ours? I think, you know, what this provides is that they'll review, they'll discuss them with each, with at least one employee in each classification, yeah. and they're also very clearly the town's job descriptions, and uh, they're not effective until we approve them. Uh, they're very professional people, and uh, you know, I, I just don't see them doing that, Councillor. Yeah. We have some very specific job descriptions for certain individuals in this town because Cape is unique, and their position in the town is unique. They would not handle. No, they, they would, but they would adjust them to follow a set format that ensures we don't get in trouble with civil rights provisions, with uh, human rights provisions. Uh, okay, I would all. only ask that over the years we, we review different individuals for different jobs for specific reasons, and that somehow you go through the minutes of the last few years and pick out those that we've set job descriptions for and that we've approved prior to their coming to town so that we can see any adjustment by the MMA on those concerns. Okay. Okay. Okay, any other yes, I come here tonight against uh, authorizing you the money to do this because I felt you could do it yourself, but you answered my question by saying you was too busy, so I don't want you to come at budget time. I want to hire a helper, so I'll support this. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries six to Thank you. Item 216 is to consider the acceptance of the remaining unaccepted portions of Hampton Road at Bayberry Lane. Right. These are shown over there in the railing on a plan that no one can see from here. Uh, I, I would like to say that this completes the Weathersfield subdivision, one that Tony Palanza has done in his family over a long, long time. Uh, was built uh, with this particular section with absolutely no problems. Uh, you know, I, I think it really is it good to have it done. It, it fits nicely. We get another uh, exit uh, from that neighborhood, another means of egress, and uh, there is uh, no reason not to accept it this evening. Move, we accept. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries 6 to Thank you. Item 216. 17 is to consider acknowledging receipt of the budget impact schedule for fiscal years 89 through 93. This is the updated five-year plan, I guess. Michael, do you have any general comments you'd like to make before we set this for full discussion at a workshop sometime in January? I, I think you should do that, yes. Okay. So moved. Second. All right, do we want to set a date in that motion? I think you're going to do that in item number 221. Oh, we are. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Lester, do you have a question? Well, what's the motion, please? To acknowledge receipt. To acknowledge receipt of the state budget. No, that's receipt, not, not... And we take it up at a workshop at a later date. Not, endorsed. not acceptance, like yeah. it says there, but to acknowledge. Right. Receipt. I'm sure there'll be a lot of 
uh, issues that we'll raise in a great deal of length at some future time. Okay, all those in favor of the motion. That motion carries unanimously. Item 218 is to consider establishing fees as established by the town subdivision regulations and take any necessary action. Michael, do you want to uh, uh, explain that further? No, I, I, I noticed the planning board chairman is in the audience yeah. and she was uh, one of the two or three persons who was involved in uh, preparing this, so I would defer to her. Alice, do you have any comments you'd like to make on the uh, recommended uh, sorry, I, I don't have the final copy in front of me. Um, it's too much, but I'll tell you that. <laughs> it's right too now. much. Yeah. Do, do you want me to well, explain it? Yeah, which of the Okay. Within the subdiv subdivision regulations, which became effective yesterday, there was a proposal, there were two provisions that authorized the council to set fees. There were probably more, but there were two that, that need to be dealt with. One was to set up an escrow account uh, as the planning board was reviewing subdivisions. What an escrow account would be if there was something specific that the planning board would want to study that was more out of the way unusual uh, than the typical things you would review, that an escrow fee could be set by the council and assessed. That'd be such things like a high intensity soil survey, a special traffic study, uh, you know, the, uh, wetlands, uh, goes in along with the soils, you know, that type of thing. Uh, with the, there was a meeting with uh, Alice and uh, Alice Rand, the chairman of the planning board, Steve Bott with the planner, and the recommendation came from them to set up the, the escrow account fee as $100 per lot or dwelling lot, whichever is greater and that an additional fee, if, if that was drawn down by 75% or well, became a balance of the equivalent, that's $25 per lot, then we would then go uh, back and ask for uh, uh, $100 per lot of dwelling again, uh, whichever is greater. So in essence, the escrow would keep going. That, that is what's recommended. For the, the second part is they also recommend that, recommended that uh, and it was passed in the subdivision regulations that there be a provision for the town acquiring open space by, by one of two methods. One is that the developer would actually give open space to the town and their obligation would be taken care of. The second is to charge a fee based on 10% of the current assessed value, because that is the language that you clarified in the minutes of the, uh, of the meeting last month, that the you charge 10% of the current assessed value of the proposed development site's land. In other words, if you take the, the assessor's valuation that was done in, in the most recent reval, in this case it would be 1978, if the land was worth in that reval $300,000, you would be charging the developer 30, if they weren't willing to donate land as part of a development, 10% of $300,000 or $30,000 for a a fee to develop recreational space somewhere else in the community. Does that sound fair? What I, that's essentially what it is. It's in keeping with what you adopted uh, last month and uh, run some specifics on it. Okay, Leslie, thank you. Well, in keeping uh, on the way I voted for this last time, I certainly would vote no because I think it's unfair to uh, request this and uh, I think we can eventually get enough land off of tax rolls by people just giving it to us with, without forcing them to do it. So that part B is why I would probably vote against item 218. Well, I would, I would just like to say that and ask a question, maybe the manager could answer for me. If a developer come in here and he was going to have 20 lots and he give a hundred bucks for each lot and they didn't use any of that hundred bucks, so that, do they keep that money for the next developer or do they give it back? Be refunded. Be refunded. Okay. And uh, number two, I'm in agreement with what Lester said and I shall vote this time the way I voted before because I'm against this, and I call it double taxation for the owner that's building a house 
of buying a house in that subdivision, you're taxing them this way, and then you're going to tax them through their property tax, and I call it double taxation. You can use any language you want, but they're going to pay for it and not the developer because it's just going to be added to the cost of the project. And therefore, that's going to be added to the house that they're going to live in. And I hope when residents come in Cape Elizabeth that we treat them all fairly and equally. And uh, I don't call this going in the way of affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth either. I think this is against affordable housing, which is what we talked about earlier. So I shall vote against it. Yes, Doug. Thank you. I think we're in trouble. I think you're in trouble. I don't think we're in trouble. But I'm going to be consistent with my earlier vote, too. We've adopted the ordinances, and I think we have to let that go. So when it comes to fees and, and uh, working on those ordinances, and I can be specific in my vote against uh, not only the escrow account fee, because I think that may get carried away with certain instances, uh, but the 10% uh, I don't think is reasonable, and it is contrary to affordable housing. So I'm, I'm going to have to remain consistent. And I don't, just as a suggestion, maybe I think we're going to be deadlocked. and may want to table it and wait Do you like to make that motion? No. no. I want to see the vote first. Well, somebody has to make a motion. I'll make a motion that we... I move the escrow account fee of $100 initial and additional escrow account fee uh, of when the initial account is drawn down 75%, hundred another $100 per lot are drawn, whichever is greater. How about B? You're going to put B in your motion? And the, and the recreation open space fee as percentage of Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, I'll, I'll second that. Any discussion? Yes. Yeah. So I have to this right ask question. The planning board has acted. We have already established right. and agreed to fees. We just haven't set the amount. Okay. And this is, already, this is from Steve Butler, but it's, it's already been to the planning board, right? I don't know. It has not been for the planning board? No. Well, you acted on a four to three vote. Like yeah. Is, it, is the fees that are in here recommended by the planning board and you just have to come back to them and get the final vote? Or just, is it just his recommendation? No, it, came, it came from the chairman of the planning board and the town plan. Uh -huh. It didn't, was, has not been reviewed by the board. Shouldn't it be? It's up to the council. think I can get both enough to take my action, but I'll move that we table it, and I think it should go back to the, and all members of the planning board be able to have a voice in it before it comes before the council. I'm not sure. You're going to refer it back? I'm not table. sure that's appropriate. Well, it may be appropriate. I don't know what it will accomplish, because they're going to set a new fee, because we didn't agree on these fees, and it's going to come back here, but you're still not going to agree on it, because you don't want any fees. Well, well, maybe they'll so reconsider. Like, Kind of a waste of your time, isn't it? Well, maybe they'll reconsider and think that we should try to make affordable housing for somebody in this town. Maybe they'll do away with it. Well, I don't care what you know. Or it was a tie vote, so the thing was defeated, so you could go on to item 219. I get it. Somebody will bring it up again sometime. Move on. Well, uh, we could do that, or we could table it to next month's meeting, or we could refer it to the planning board. Does anybody want to take any? I, uh, I, I, I don't think it's appropriate to refer it to the planning board, because I don't think it's their job to set fees. I think it's our job. Okay. 
they made the recommendation for the concept. Mm -hmm. And we went along with, with the concept. And we have to implement it with these. So I'm going to move to table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of table? All those opposed? Okay. All right, item 219. Consider the acceptance of roads in the Manta Heights subdivision and take any necessary action. The necessary materials have not been received, Madam Chairman, and I would encourage the council to table this until the January meeting. So, so, so yeah. All those in favor? Oh, oh. Item 220. Yes, Nancy. <coughs> May I request, respect, respectfully request from the council that this item uh, be taken up out of order at the end of the items. We only have three more. And I also request um, unanimous consent to abstain on item 220 because of the financing of the project. That is my reason for asking to put it at the end of, of the agenda so that when we're finished with the other items, I can read it. Okay. All those uh, in favor of May I? Moving this item to the end of the agenda. I'd like to ask these people that have been waiting here all evening whether they would mind if we moved this on to the end of the, I think it's a courtesy. It's just that the other two items are very good. I don't know about that. Yeah. I think they are. Anyway. I move we take item, uh, we'll put 220 out of order. We'll take 221 and 222 out of order. Second. No, it's, it's, yeah, well. 21 and 2. Yeah, take whatever it is. 23. 21 and 22, and then it's 20. And then 23. There's another one. Yeah. There's another one. Yeah. There's another one. Okay, then 23. You're not going to do that? Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Then motion carries. Okay, item 221 is to consider establishing a date in January for a workshop to prepare uh, our goals for 1988 <coughs> and to review the uh, budget in depth. Yeah. Who's the date of the regular council meeting? The 11th. The 11th, yeah. I suggested you might want to do it the 4th, that Monday before. Get a good start the first week night of the new year. Is that all right with everybody? I have another I haven't even got meeting I should attend. I have no uh, idea. I don't, but I know then something will happen on the 4th. Is that a Monday? Which day of the week is it? Monday. How about Wednesday the 6th? Wednesday the 6th, then after this, a, a big deal, but the chairman of the Comprehensive Planning Committee, the vice chairman of the Comprehensive Planning Committee, and set up a date with the video production committee to work on a video preparation for public meetings for a company that's planning on that date. And it's however a date that you can change if everybody else is available to come. I can certainly change the date with the video people. What's the sixth on a Wednesday? Wednesday? Well, if everyone can come, we should do it on a Wednesday and I'll work with video people on a new day. Okay, January 6th, all right, then, everybody. What time? Seven? Seven to four? No, I don't How about seven? What else are we going to do, Michael, besides the budget? You go, you're going over the budget impact schedule, and then you're, you're going to uh, do your goal setting process for the year. Everybody's agreeable? Yep. yep. January 7th at 7. 7. Okay. Item 222 is to consider the appointment of an acting town manager to serve during an upcoming absence of the town manager. Uh, we have talked before about uh, the rotating substitute manager's uh, plan that we've had, and I guess we're getting to the end of that rotation. If Almost everybody has had a chance to serve now uh, when Reggie's been alive. And so that would be another policy that we'll want to review from maybe in January. 
So for this here, I probably shouldn't do it because of the name of the person, but it's not a relative. I let these people know. It is distant, but not too close. I'll move that Barbara Jordan be acting town manager while the manager is away at the National League of City meeting. Is that, is that okay with you, sir? That's fine. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? I would also at this time uh, like to uh, appoint a uh, member of the council to act as uh, temporary chairman on Monday at Monday evening's meeting. Uh, both Billy and I will also be going to the National League of City. Uh, meeting and Penny said she would be happy to do that. The council agrees. Uh, I would seek your indulgence to uh, accept my appointing Penny to be the temporary chairman. Just one vote. Yeah. Just all one vote, one meeting, one All minute. she has to do is start the meeting off, that's all. Is that acceptable, Terry? Okay. I think it's up to the ones that's going to be sitting here where they put up with them. <laughs> <laughs> one vote. It is a whole new group, too. Except for less than. All right, and item 223 is to, uh, to consider a recommendation from the Riverside Cemetery trustees to adjust the cemetery lot price, including perpetual care, from $200 a lot to $300 per lot. This is an addendum to the agenda, which we received uh, last week. Michael, do you want to? This came in your packet on Tuesday. Packet the, the supplemental packet. The trustees of Riverside Memorial Cemetery. Uh, uh, yes, Michael, are you ready? Yes, I, I started speaking once. Ready. Okay. The council didn't say you ready. The trustees of the Riverside Memorial Cemetery uh, have recommended that the fee for cemetery lots at Riverside Cemetery be adjusted from $200 per lot to $300 per lot. Yeah. During the, the early 1980s, the cemetery was having uh, uh, gravy years uh, when interest rates were up at uh, 11 and 12 percent. We're now only gaining uh, interest on our perpetual care funds in the range of uh, 7 to 8 percent. What that means is that the income to operate the cemetery uh, has significantly fallen. Uh, what it, what it comes down to is at this point we are only raising enough money uh, to essentially provide for the perpetual care and we're only really charging for perpetual care. We're doing absolutely nothing to recognize the cost that, it, that, that was incurred to create that lot nor to replace that lot. Uh, we've been having a, a rapid increase in the number of cemetery lots being sold. Uh, the trustees are addressing that with tighter restrictions on residency. Uh, some people, you know, we, we're having family members buy it and then, you know, it gets out way beyond allocating lots to brothers and sisters that, know, that never lived in Cape Elizabeth that lived elsewhere. Uh, you know, what's happening is the cemetery space is being used up uh, considerably. Uh, part of it, we think part of the reason is, is because our fee is considerably lower than other cemeteries. I think another reason it's being used up is because everyone appreciates how beautiful that cemetery is. Uh, the third reason it's being used up is, you know, obviously uh, people are dying. Uh, I think that one comes obviously. Uh, yeah, but as your schedule says, uh, there are new people arriving similar to the ones that are passing away. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, one thing that's happening, the community, as it, as it grows, people don't have the roots with the places they grew up in. And, you know, a lot of the people who are moving into Cape Elizabeth now are buying lots, uh, you know, and there's going to be more and more demand on that cemetery all the time. One of my goals this coming year is going to be to create a plan to create new cemetery lots. I'm not sure whether that's going to be 10 years from now or when it is it's going to be done, but I think now is the time we need to begin to develop that plan. I think now is also the time we've got to begin to generate the revenue to, to expand the cemetery space. Uh, or otherwise, you're going to have to take it out of the general fund. It's, you know, so I think you really have a choice to raise the cemetery lots, to pro raise the price of cemetery lots to provide for the, the eventual replacement of the lot that, that was created, or recognizing you're eventually going to have to use general fund monies to support the creation of additional cemetery space. And I think it's, it's much more fiscally prudent uh, to uh, 
have it uh, as, as a user fee and to have the cemetery uh, as much as possible uh, pay itself to be a going concern. Not to make a profit, to be a going concern. Why should, why should these people passing away today have to put money in there to create a place for somebody in the future? That's what you're saying if you're going to ex expand a, no. a cemetery. Well, you certainly are. What I'm saying is, is that right now they're not paying a nickel for the cost for creating the lots that they're now buying. All they're paying for is perpetual care costs. That's the way it was set up originally, way back. No, I, well, that was yes, when you when you had a cemetery that was given to you for nothing, and you didn't have to actually actually create cemetery lots. We're now at the point where we were we we expanded significantly. Uh, you know, the, the, those lots have to be paid for, and as as a lot is used, it has to be replaced. So you know what really people are paying for is the the lots that are being going in now. Uh, for the, the lots that start starting now to be used, what the cost to have created that lot is. You know, they are they are buying a, a piece of real estate. Well, we should buy in some other town where the real estate isn't as high. <laughs> Just when we get affordable housing, that's the price. <laughs> no, I, that's the only affordable housing. You know, I don't like to. <laughs> I don't like to raise fees, uh, even though you know I occasionally recommend it. But at the same time, uh, you know, I, I think you need to recognize that you're going to have to create more cemetery space, and that you're using it. And the people who use the cemetery space should pay for what it cost to have created that space. We we paid about 150,000 for uh, a, for cemetery space to be created that we're now selling. Uh, that money's all come out of the general fund. So you know, I, I think it's about time that uh, you know, we, we avoid having to go in to do that in the future and that as we sell lots now we recognize that there was a cost uh, to create that space. So what you're saying is the residents of the town of Cape Elizabeth that live here now that uh, might someday buy a lot in the future should pay again to, for that lot. They shouldn't do it through taxation. Why? Because they might move out of town and not want the lot? Or? No, they still have a lot. No, all I'm saying is, the, is that well, yes, but you're, you're the cemetery asking, should pay itself. You're doing it two ways. You're doing it double. You're paying for reserving capacity, <laughs> right? Well, we as I heard just a minute ago, which I thought pretty good, but I uh, repeat it, but it's pretty reasonable housing for well, many uh, years. Yes, and, and shouldn't we think about sort of being competitive with other cemeteries? We do have a list of other charges and um, Cape Elizabeth is uh, quite uh, modest, as I remember. We, and really, we, we do want to encourage the youth by residents of the town, not uh, people from South Portland or Portland who might see a cheaper lot. Better go and come out and compare us and shop. <laughs> Christmas, they get a scenic <laughs> vista, do they? Is that what you're saying? Well, that's where I'm going because the view's the best in town. I know, but I don't want to have my feet wet. <laughs> I am worried about that, so I'm going to get a lot of it. It's getting late. Well, it is getting late. We do have people here waiting for the next item. Uh, this we is the recommendation so of, uh, of the trustees. And uh, I, for one, am personally pleased that they are fiscally responsible and <laughs> are making this recommendation. I move. We accept the recommendation of the cemetery trustees to increase the lot fee from $200 to $300. I do not have that piece of paper in front of me because there's some reason you need to begin it. Yeah, I, I wanted it effective immediately. Because of yeah, the good exactly. weather, the cemetery is still open. Right. And I, I don't want to run on lots the next couple of weeks and because, you know, what would happen is we, may, we could end up selling 200 lots, uh, you know, at the lower fee and defeat the purpose and use up all that space. So I do effective. effective immediately. Effective immediately. With cremane lots to remain at one half the Yes. The cremane half lots at one half the charge. Is that a real word? Cremane, yes. M I M E I N? M A I N, yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Yes. Yeah, uh, where where is this money go? Uh, when you collect three hundred dollars, uh, you're gonna put this in a special fund for future 
property? Or? Yes, it goes into the Riverside Cemetery Trust Fund. Okay, are we ready for the motion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, motion carries unanimously. I don't okay. feel you should pick on people that have passed away. All right. Uh, we're back. They can't vote. back now vote. to item 220, which is to consider a request from Brown Homes Incorporated to relocate and enlarge the right way of the Sparrow Cameron up to go to go press farm. Uh, we have met on this a couple of times now, too. Uh, we did ask Michael um, and Tom to talk to uh, representatives from uh, Gullcrest Home, and we do have a proposal before us tonight, and Michael, maybe you would like to highlight that. Uh, I'm all talked out tonight. I'll, okay. I'll, uh, I'll defer to the temperature. Will we accept their offer? Before I open my briefcase, Madam Chairman, maybe it might be uh, worthwhile since last time the uh, representatives were making the request did not have an opportunity to present the request to have them present where we are today, what they are offering, what are they, what they are asking, and to give you a better flavor for what the proposal is. Uh, I'll be glad to respond, and uh, should the chair or any member of the town council feel that a uh, executive session is required, we could do that then, but I think it would very much help the board to hear from them uh, just where it's at, what they're proposing, and uh, we can, again, we could always go into executive session later, but I abide by your will on that. I think that would be most productive. All right. Is that suggestion acceptable to everybody? It is acceptable. Okay. Would, Brown Holmes, would you like to make your presentation? This will be affordable housing, I take it. I hope so. <laughs> By at least uh, some, some people. <laughs> My name is Robert Bruce, and I'm uh, affiliated with uh, Earl Brown and Brown Homes in this uh, Gullcrest Farm development. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with the, uh, with the property, having uh, had a view of the site uh, a week or so ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually. Uh, the property uh, lies between Spurwink Avenue and Fowler Road and does not abut uh, either road. Uh, we have a, a right of way that meets the street design standards out to Fowler Road, but our right of way to Spurwink Avenue is only 25 feet wide and the uh, subdivision regulations require a 50 foot wide right of way. So our request is for a new 50-foot right of way to Sparrowink Avenue. Now, certain questions were raised uh, by members of the council uh, after our last meeting, and I'll try to uh, address those, uh, uh, each of those that were brought to my attention. Uh, the new right of way has been relocated and it now lies in the optimum spot giving uh, it's been measured by Owen Haskell the surveyor and it, there's a 400 foot uh, line of sight in both directions and the, the, the new right of way is in the, the, the spot which gives uh, the best line of sight in, in uh, neither direction uh, and I've discussed this with Mr. Hunter pursuant to um, Mr. McGovern's suggestion. Uh, the uh, more southerly lot that uh, it's over on the board, but the, the, the smaller remaining lot has uh, 41,783 41, square feet. And the northerly lot measured up to the northerly edge of the waterline easement is 84,298 square feet. Now, uh, under the proposal, the uh, both of the remaining encumbrances that are shown on the map 
would be completely removed. Uh, the existing right of way, that, uh, that easement would be uh, given up and eliminated, and also the water line easement uh, to the north of the, of the existing right of way uh, would be eliminated. So the land would be completely unencumbered from the new right of way over to other land uh, belonging to the town. And uh, the uh, buffer strip, once the, once the water line easement is removed, there would be a buffer street, but, uh, a buffer zone uh, between the, uh, the northerly edge of a conforming 80,000 uh, square foot lot and Denison Avenue, the access road to the transfer station, of around 14 or 15,000 square feet. That's one of the questions that was raised. Um, the, 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 perhaps the terms of the uh, arrangement are, are, are familiar to you already, but um, I, I can assure the council that the poor of the town of Cape Elizabeth are very, very, being very well represented by Mr. McGovern and Mr. Leahy. Um, and they um, negotiated a, a substantial um, monetary consideration for the benefit of the poor. And I, and I did fail to mention that this land is actually held in trust by the town for the benefit of the poor. So this payment would be made for the, for the widening of this right of way. Uh, and in addition, there would be an easement uh, along the, the um, northerly edge of the Gullcrest Farm property given to the town to straighten out a small encroachment problem that exists over there. The uh, actual uh, uh, the, the road, the dump road kind of flops back and forth across the property line and that was a minor problem that would be taken care of. Now these are the matters, uh, the technical considerations as far as the, as the new right of way is concerned and the consideration for it. But I think the most important part of this uh, um, is that it, it will give the, uh, the planning board, really, a choice between our development going out to Fowler Road and going to Sperling uh, Avenue. I can't speak for the planning board, but I, I feel strongly that they will applaud the uh, access to this development from Spurwick Avenue rather than, than from uh, Fowler Road. Uh, and that's how we're going to propose it and design it. And I, and I would hope they would accept that and expect that they would. But I, again, of course, can't speak for them. Can't speak for the people who live over in Fowler Road, but I think that they, too, would applaud anything that, that set this uh, uh, push this development out on Sperling Avenue rather than into uh, onto Fowler Road, which is a, a very well built up, established residential area and the Fowler Road right of way runs right through the residential area there. So um, uh, we urge you to uh, uh, take favorable action on our request and uh, I will answer any other questions that may come to mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, are there members from the public who would like to speak on this proposal? Anybody? We do have uh, a letter from uh, Florence and Francis Brosnan, Brosnan urging approval of the entrance uh, on Sparrow Avenue, their residence. Okay, Tom, um, <clears throat> only, Madam Chairman, that I think we're, I was left with the instructions to go and negotiate. We have uh, this is property that's owned and trust by the town, and uh, I think that the proposed order adequately covers the various concerns that, that I have raised. Uh, the dollar amount, anybody can. Uh, have an opinion whether that's adequate or inadequate. We think that that given everything and the negotiation took place, it's, it's adequate. The concern of the additional 
a lot was raised, and I, they worked around that. I spoke to Mr. Hunter tonight and confirmed with him that that was the optimum location uh, for the uh, sight distances from that entrance. So uh, he did confirm that to me. I don't know if the town has anything official from him, but uh, just wanted to confirm that their office was involved with the location at that location. Um, so I, I have addressed uh, a number of issues at different times in letters, but. Uh, and I'll be glad to respond at this point to any specific questions. But. Questions? I don't, Go ahead. Okay. I have one question. You figure the document co covers everything as far as the land and the deed to the land to the town and the poor and so on and so forth? Well, what I've done is said that the, in the proposed council order, I have asked that there be a provision that should I uh, determine uh, hereafter that a court order would be required that they would agree to that, to that proceeding. I've done that with the knowledge that in the past there have been certain dispositions of, in some ways, either lease or otherwise, or use by the uh, town poor farm property without court action. But I think a good question was raised as to exactly what can we do with this, and I think it, uh, I, I don't, I doubt that a court would not allow it, but I think that a, a, a conservative approach may be to get court approval. I've indicated to them that I think it's a toss of the coin and that I'd be glad to be persuaded otherwise, but that that's the way it stood right now. And uh, this way, I think it allowed the council here to proceed. Um, and if we feel that court approval is necessary to ensure that you have the right to do this, fine. But I think this is really a swap of land. You're getting two easements released, you're widening an easement, and you're getting some consideration. It's not like you're disposing of the property, period. Okay, well, I'm in agreement on the, the swapping of the land and where they're putting the right-of-way. I just wanted to clear my mind. I, I looked that over roughly, and I need another attorney to interpret it all for me, but uh, I just wanted to know if you felt that it was a document that the town could stand behind, and I understand that, and I see in that provision that you have a provision that yeah. some of the heirs someday along the way here decide that we're doing something wrong with that property, you have a chance to go back and talk to those people. Is that correct? That's correct. Do I understand it correct? Okay. So I'll move that we accept their offer. Is there a second? Yeah, well, they may go uh, back and talk uh, to what people? Brown Holmes or, yeah. or the heirs? We accept the offer of Brown Homes for the right of way. No, 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 no. The, the, the right to. We're accepting the request to enlarge the right of way. And relocate the right of way. Relocate it from on Spurwick Road. That's correct. In exchange for which they will release, they will release the waterline easement and the existing right of way and pay the sum of $35,000 subject to they're getting approval by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board for a development that requires access and further subject to in the town or town's attorney discretion of a court approval if deemed required. The trust is ancient. It's, it's, uh, it's very short. It simply says that it's given to the town and trust forever for the town's poor. And the question is, is, does that imply a power to do what you're doing tonight or not? And if so, even if it's implied, do you need a court's blessing? And I've raised the issue. Uh, we've discussed it. And to date, I haven't been satisfied that they don't need it, but I'm not sure they do. I, there are some areas that we just can't give you a hard and fast answer on. I, if this is approved, then we will determine that immediately. We told them we would, you know, immediately determine whether court approval would be required. But that doesn't affect what your action is tonight. If, if they can't, if court approval is required and they can't get it, then they, they can't do it. If, it. if they get the approval, fine. So what you just said is what is in the proposed council order. That's right. The order so that you should have. have to read if anybody wanted it, but now that you said that, we're going to have to do that, right? Well, I didn't the, really the order, the, the order I don't you should, the order you should have has A through F as conditions. There was an okay. earlier one that had through E. The one you should be voting on has through F. I believe that's the one before. Okay. I think, I think Penny, Penny, I think it might be a good idea if you delete it, if you don't mind. Delete it, motion. 
Uh, Billy, if you want to. No, I can read. Penny loves to read. What, what she loves to read. Why do you think I let Debbie read it. I just thought everybody that's here would be like to see and know what, what's in the song. Technically, the council rules said that every ordinance order is set up. Really spoke. Yeah, usually there are only a few lines long. Right. Well, it's just a bell. Proposed order regarding item number, what is it? 220. 220. It is hereby ordered the town land to execute on behalf of the town the indenture with Brown Homes Inc. or its nominee, a copy of which is attached here too, relating to relocation and redefinition of a right of way from Sperling Avenue to the so called Gullcrest Farm property. That the executed indenture be held in escrow by Monaghan Lady Pocadell and Libby Law Firm or its successor and delivered to Brown Homes, Inc. or its nominee upon occurrence of the following events. A, payment of $35,000 to the town of Cape Elizabeth by Brown Homes, Inc., Brown Homes, Inc. or its nominee. B, approval by the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board upon such conditions as may be accepted by Brown Homes, Inc. or its nominee of its proposed subdivision of the so-called Gulfcraft Farm Property including the condition that the right of way to Spurwick Avenue be utilized for the subdivision. C, execution and delivery of the deed by Lee R. Levitt and Ava C. Levitt, or their successes entitled, to Brown Homes Inc. of the so-called Gulfcrest property described in the deed recorded, recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds, Book 4901, page 234. D, received by the town of a title opinion from Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry, the attorneys for Brown Homes Inc., or its nominee, indicating that good and marketable title is being conveyed to the town with respect to the easements being released in paragraphs one and two of the indenture. E, court approval of the transfer consideration, therefore, from the Cumberland County Probate Court is deemed required, required by the Cape Elizabeth Town Attorney. And F, execution and delivery of a deed by Brown Homes Inc. to the Town of Cape Elizabeth conveying a conservation easement 50 feet in width along the northwesterly sideline of the so-called Gullcrest Farm property being in a north 57 degrees 37 10 east direction commencing at the 5 8 inch rebar set at the easterly terminus of the 30-foot common waterline easement shown on a plan of land on Spurwick Avenue for Brown Homes Inc. by Owen Haskell, dated October 20th, 1987, and revised December 2nd, 1987. This easement will allow the town of Cape Elizabeth the right to maintain and improve its existing refuge center roadway and shall provide a buffer for the Gullcrest Farm property. $35,000 will be received by the town, shall be held in trust and used for the benefit of the poor in accordance with the terms of the will of Thomas Jordan. Thank you very much, Penny. Are there further questions or comments? Yes, that. Just one real small comment. On the Section C, it mentions Brown Homes Incorporated, but it does not mention or its nominee, and that's consistent. And I wonder if it just ought to be inserted. I mean, you went to such great lengths putting it everywhere mm -hmm. out. <laughs> I have no problem. I'm sure it's no problem with them. <laughs> we got a gift. What are we doing with the change? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Who would question? Okay, all those in favor of the motion as amended. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm sorry that both meetings where you were on the agenda, you were the last one on the agenda. You're one of the few items that got off. <laughs> yeah, but that's right. They are one of the few items that got you in. Yeah, that's true. Except for the minutes tonight, that was about it. Okay, are there any, is there anyone in the, uh, from the public who has anything else they'd like to bring before the council? If not, uh, are there any councils that have anything to say? Yes, I just want to, uh, I observed going to the dump 
that uh, people from time to time solicit money and they hold up. It holds up the whole line of traffic, sometimes with no one even in the transfer station dumping. Uh, I, I think if they're going to do this, they should do it when the people are leaving the dump, not entering the dump. I, I, I agree. I mean, everybody wants to support the hockey, the soccer, and the cross team. But if they just had an area where they would have set up and try to coax people into coming in and buying some of the raffles, it's better than you know, just charging onto the vehicle. Because we had the school board up there, too. And they shouldn't pass out pamphlets before you go to the dump either. They should be Get the, away. But the only wait, yeah, but the only wait is at the beginning on your way in. Yes, Michael? Okay, that actually requires amendment and preview to solve any regulation. Read some. I will put that with you. Remember that. Thank you. Anything else to come before the council tonight? Very, very good. Oh, sorry. Um, go ahead. Want me? Yeah. You want to go first? Okay. Okay. Um, I really apologize for being so late. We were going to do this earlier, and I thought, might as well do it as your, as your time runs out. But as immediate past chairman of this council, it was uh, my good luck to be able to present to you for the outstanding work that you've done all year and the continued excellence established by my term. It's uh, a gavel. And also for the additional burden of being on television. I know that. <laughs> causes additional concerns and you have to be very careful what you say. Uh, you do, I don't. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, in, in sincere appreciation for all the work you've done and uh, uh, from all the council, including Frank, we uh, would like to thank you this plaque and gavel final. Thank you very much. I would, I would just like to say, I got a couple of things I want to say, but I just want to let the TV people go home if they okay. want to go home. Yeah. And I so can bring it up. It's not too important. It's about trash and dumps and things we like that. But, it, but we could adjourn the meeting. What do you think, sir, manager? Should I mention I this stuff here on TV and make the people aware of what might be coming down the pipe? <laughs> I think we need an extensive report on that. Before. Rather soon, but uh, okay. you might want to bring it up tonight and kick it off. Uh, yes. Move with you. All right. Second. Second. All those in favor. Aye. Good night. All right. Thank you. Thank the meeting is adjourned. 11.10. 11.15. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> I'm a little bit concerned that it's not a collective.